Hello everyone, welcome to, what's today? Wednesday, I think, right? Welcome to Wednesday, one o'clock for some awesome FileMaker training. I'm Richard Carlton, creator of FMTraining.tv where we have great on-demand FileMaker training as well as live, live broadcasts which require copious amounts of Diet Coke. So today is day two of two days on FileMaker Go. It's kind of an open question and answer, but we're gonna be going through basically playing with the um, the uh, FileMaker Go training tool. Um, I posted the link to the 18 uh, Go training tool. Uh, you guys can have that, folks can have that. So anyway, so yeah, so we're gonna be looking at this tool, the 18 tool you have, there's almost no changes with 19 tool. Claris really hasn't added too much. I mean, I think they're putting all their eggs in the, uh, eggs in the basket. Um, they are starting again on their ETS testing, so they are, um, starting to kick out their incremental revs to the product, I guess. Um, that's that quarterly release thing. We were we kept asking, like, if you guys can do another quarterly release, you might want to let us know. And, you know, or we're just not testing anymore. We're just going to, like, launch it. Let's see. Um, so we're talking about the Go Training tool. We also have it over here on the iPad. I'm going to show you everyone the iPad. It is connected to the computer via the lightning connector over here. And I'm going to use QuickTime to kind of look at it. So we're back to me having only two hands, but really I need two hands in the keyboard. Actually, I need four hands here. So let's go ahead and dive in here. Um, so we've got the uh, Go Training tool. Uh, I'm going to escape out of playing this uh, video. I'm going to come up to QuickTime. I'm going to say File, New Movie, Recording. And once again, you'll see the little recording tab. There's my two faces waving to each other. Uh, I'm going to switch the video source out to the iPad. And so this is running the latest operating system. Um, I like the iPad for what it is. I don't use it that often unless literally I'm on the road and I can't use a a uh, a laptop. So the iPad's really useful in the helicopter uh, mounted on the window somewhere or someplace else or on a kneeboard. Uh, but any, I mean, if I can have an access to a regular Mac laptop, I'll always take that over the iPad unless you can't be, you know, you can't fly and type at the same time. Um, at least I can't. So. Um, so this little controller here, you can disregard that. That's as part of the, if I was gonna actually record the video here of this iPad. So if you're actually ever making a demo for someone of your FileMaker solution and you wanna record the iPad, that's how you kind of do it, at least on the Mac side. So uh, so we're logged onto the same file in both locations. I am accessing it from a FileMaker server. An area I wanted to get to yesterday, we didn't quite get to, was the area about calculations. I'm gonna press the button there, then I'm gonna come back over here, and I'm gonna press the button right there. And what, what the first one here is very, very important. I'm going to take a look at this. I'm going to move myself out of the way here a little bit. Move it over here. I can kind of zoom in. Let me go ahead and just do the zoomy thing. It'll make life a little better for everyone. Um, makes it a little more dicey for me because the pixel, it's a little more pixelated, but it should be sufficiently sharp with the uh, clarity here. So what we have is that the idea is once again that you run these, uh, you run this on, um, on your Mac or Windows computer, and then you also run on Go at the same time. And so what you could do is you run this, it's gonna run a script, it'll run this get system, uh, system. And you say, get that, and it comes back one. So I'm running on FileMaker Pro, technically with an Intel Mac, right? If it was a negative two, it would be Windows with FileMaker Pro. Um, and then obviously if I come down here, I get device, it'll say one for Macs, two for running Windows. Once again, you, you need to use both these together to kind of get an idea of really what's going on because um, because in the technical documentation, I kind of updated the technical documentation. I said, oh, well, I'll tell you that you're using Intel Mac, but it, it only shows up if you're using uh, an Intel Mac with uh, Pro because you could be on an Intel Mac with WebDirect and then you get number four. So you can fire this up with WebDirect, it's kind of cool. So I'm gonna go ahead and come over here to the iPad. I'm gonna go ahead and press the button right there. So we should theoretically get a three right there on that one, which we do. And the bottom one, it's an iPad any model. We get a three there as well. If it's a, uh, if it's an iPhone or iPod touch, some sort of smaller form factor, then you're gonna get the four. And then, so what you can do, what's interesting is that, and there's a, gra see the, see this is one of those, remember we had the webinar, we talked about uh, sizing and things like that, right? We talked about the, uh, getting the uh, graphics to fit was that conversation with Nick Hunter? Look over here. So similar to Windows on the Mac, so Mac from Mac, Macintosh to iOS, um, 
The fonts with left and right will be the same, but they stretch vertically taller like another 10%. And so in order to get this to look good on Windows, what we have to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to go to layout mode. You would take the text right here. I'm just over here. I'm going to move over here. The window's a little bit on the big side, so I want to apologize for that. I'm going to zoom back out just a smidge. I'm going to scroll right a little bit. And I'm going to grab that, and I'm going to, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag it out a little bit like this is what you have to do to get it to work on Windows correctly, if that makes sense. And then I'll move that over there a little bit. Um, problem is Windows tends to stretch things, so you've got to be careful with that. <clears throat> Come out, should line up under there. It's not lining up. Hello. All right, that's about like that. We might have to check that later. And so you get these going, you get these moved over here, but you need a space, you know, right here, to see a space to the right. That's for Windows. For iOS, you've got to drag it down. So to the right, so if you're building on the Mac, you've got to drag it to the right to support Windows and drag it down to support iOS. Now, if I go back to browse mode, I'm over here. Just watch it. I'm going to come over here, hit uh, browse mode, and then you'll watch that update right there. So I'll hit browse mode, saves it. Now it's bigger, it fits, right? Because it's a little bit taller. Okay, so that's one of the ways of handling that issue. Um, so that's a couple good issues. Moving along, um, that's the issue with the, we have a section of calculations here. And these are all the calculations that are slightly different or do somewhat different things. And, and we are going to check and verify and update these. Obviously, there are modifier keys on the Mac unless you have a keyboard on your iPad, which I have a keyboard, but I, I used it for the first week and then I don't use it anymore. Anyway, so there's modifier keys there over here. We're not going to see that too much. Uh, the modifier keys really don't do anything. Um, in terms of, if I go back to that, we have application version. That's obvious, right? If I run that over here, you're going to get Go. And this is Go 1901, uh, build 88. Uh, so we got back to calculations over here. Screen dimension, super, super, super important. And so. This gets kind of into this. There's a conversation that goes in here. You can read through all this. Um, the bottom line, though, is that you can. Uh, oh, that's the uh, GPS right there. So it's trying to do a GPS search on this. I, I jumped out of the uh, the one screen. So here's the thing. So here's a really important thing. Uh, back to the screen thing. So let me go back to previous. Um, one is that. Uh, you can, on an iOS device, lock the rotation, okay? So you can't really see it. Oh, yeah, now it's kind of sideways. I don't know if you can see that. So as I turned it, I didn't rotate because as I'm sitting here wrestling and doing things, I might hold it and then use the mouse, and I don't want it rotating on the screen and making a mess. Um, so the device allows for that, but the issue is at one point there was a script step said, uh, you know, prevent the to stop the rotation, don't let the script steps that don't allow the iPad or FileMaker go to rotate. And Apple came out against that. Um, not only did they slightly dislike it, they eventually that there was a there was a command you could call on Xcode that Go would call it through your script step and it would lock the rotation. So an app could force you not would, I mean you could turn the device but it's not going to auto rotate. Um, that was deprecated, as they say in the business, kind of like run times are no longer 19. That command is no longer, hasn't been around for a couple of years. But what's interesting about it is that it leads to another thought, because the first thing we did is when we were transitioning from desktop interfaces to iOS interfaces, we're like, well, we already know how to build like a landscape interface here, right? So you've got this, I'm over here moving my hands, but you got this landscape interface over here, right? as opposed to a portrait interface. And so since we already have a Mac interface, it looks like this. How hard is it to adapt it to make it look like this on an iPad? Not too hard. We might even be able to combine the two to have one layout. So that's one thing, OK? But then Apple said, no, 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 all these apps that do that, you guys are just making crappy apps. We want to be a professional and beautiful and make it a nice experience and blah, blah, blah. So they, they turned it off and deprecated it. And so it got to a point where we had to support the idea of that the FileMaker layout has to kind of reflow. So once again, we have this idea of objects that are sliding around, right? Like if I go over here and it, you don't really, see, oh, not on that window. Let me go over to FileMaker over here. So if I grab this around, you can see, see everything's locked on the left. This is a very basic app. It doesn't auto flow. <clears throat> but if you go to like a start, um, if we go to like a starting point, right? If I go to starting point in here, which hopefully is, do I have a starting point in here? Or do I not even have a current starting point? Golden Master 19, that's something else. Where's starting point? I guess I could just open it. 
Um, the idea is that you get an application that will auto flow. Oh, well, there's the starting point seven. By the way, today they're shipping starting point uh, eight. Um, it's a 2020 version. If you've got 17, don't worry about it. There's some bug fixes. We're gonna have a punch list of the things we changed. So check this out. So here is starting point seven. Eight, uh, the new one looks identical to it, right? So just understand that. So as I come over here to the accounts, move myself out of the way. I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. Um, as I grab this and move it, right, you notice how things are flowing on screen. So if they flow here a little bit, imagine how much they have to flow on an iPad when you go from here to down here. They really have to flow. And so that's why we have this layout over here. If we go to touch, we go to contacts, data entry screen. Once again, starting point is a great CRM, but it's also a really awesome training tool about how Nick would do things in a you know certain world and certain environments. So we're on this layout now. Did it jump or am I still? No, it didn't jump. I need to, it's starting point. If you want to play with the different layouts, you go to scripts and you say, uh, oh, not script debugger, you go to script. Scripts here, sorry, script workspace, and you're going to go to uh, set device mode. And we're going to tell the computer we want to be on a touch device, okay? So now if I go home, it's going to start layouts that are specific to touch. Now, I'm on this screen right here, so watch as I move it in and out, like for a phone, right? It starts to really take off and do these things, right? So if I, uh, if I come over here to my iPad, I'm going to go ahead and open up... Uh, uh, <laughs> okay, great. Let me just, uh, I'm going to close that app right now. I'm going to see if I can share this app, do a peer to peer ad hoc sharing real quick for you. I'm going to go file, sharing, share with FileMaker clients. It should say peer to peer, and it should say pro or go clients only, right? We've talked about that. We're going to say on all users. I say okay. Then if I come over here and I'm on the iPad down here, I can, oop, let me get my mouse. I can go to my host. I'm going to come back to host. I'm going to force the host to update. Um, what I want to point out right now, though, real quick, is notice if I turn it, it doesn't rotate. The device is set to be locked. I'm going to go to the home screen real quick. I'm going to pull down the little menu in the top of the Mac. I'm going to hit the rotation release button, which is this little red one over here. And so it's going to release the rotation on it. I'm going to go back to the home screen. I'm going to go back to go. It's going to uh, restore the file. I'm going to go to contacts. And then what will happen is you're going to see me rotate over here. And then it will rotate on the screen there. So you ready? Here we go. One, two, three. And notice how the screen reflows. Very important that you support that, right? So you have to have layouts that if you look at them in pro, they look a little goofy. If I go script workspace, I go to, I just run that script. I say set me back to mouse. I go to, I go to contacts, but I want to go to layout mode. And I go to layout mode, I go touch, I say uh, contact, I go to the contact date entry for touch uh, right here. You'll see how it's structured. Look how different that is. That's very different than the other way we had it structured. So once again, that's why starting point is so great. Uh, we basically left the breadcrumbs out for you to figure out how to build stuff. So if I come over, I'm just going to get rid of the left and right panes here on this. I'm going to do the same thing over here, get rid of left and right panes here on this one. And so these are literally the two layouts that were built by Nick, right? So one is this this layout here has the 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 the, um, the master detail portal. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's it's like not a bunny very compliant thing. It's a little complicated, unfortunately. So what I do is I when I train people, I say let's just use the bunny compliant. This is the the basic layout. It's actually what I prefer. I like it simpler. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and close that. And uh, that's my go there. But this is the layouts as we're building them. So that's the iPad layout there. And this is the, uh, this is the, the uh, Mac layout or the Windows layout, the touch layout, or the mouse layout. My apologies for that. So questions along the way. Everyone is lost. I'm off. She's got me. I really wish FileMaker had collapsible portals or containers or something. Yeah. So I asked, I had a meeting with the senior management, the product management team. I said, are you guys going to do, because Nick in the training video shows you how to do the accordion views. I don't know if you've seen these. Accordion view is where you can turn the arrow. It's basically using slide panels to fake an accordion view. The idea is accordion is like this thing that kind of, it's so it does this right and so the accordion view is if it's all you start turning the arrows they kind of pop down so that's how you, you you have to fake it though it's not real it's a it's a hack right so um totally a hack nick says oh it's not a hack right so 
So no one tell Nick that we're talking about him behind his back. He would, uh, he'd, he'd be laughing about that. And he'd want to come over here and argue with me, right? So, um, so I asked Claire, I said, are you guys going to add any new, you know, like accordion views or this other stuff? And they're like, eh, no. They basically, uh, I, they said nothing in the near term, which basically means uh, no, 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 is what that means, right? So um, I think that they're working on more bigger strategic issues, user interface tools like objects in the layout, I don't think are anywhere remotely on their radar. Um, I was pretty sure about that, but um, I just thought I would float that one out there to them. So I think what they're going to do is these add-ons, right? Once again, if we go to about, talk about add-ons, so if I turn on the left and right pane and layout mode, once again, the left pane, right pane. There are three panels to the left pane. There are four panels to the right pane. This add-ons right here is new in 19. Um, and you have to add things right here and it pops up. This is the area that's going to, that when you watched us during the 19, initially 19 release, we saw there were additional things down here that did other things that are really great. These right here have been in the product for a while. They're really basic. The new cool ones down there are calendars and heat maps and certain kinds of charts and a Kanban board and all this other stuff. And, and so they've been having issues trying to get that working on WebDirect is the issue with that. So it works great on Pro, works great on Go, but they held it because they want to work on WebDirect because everything has to work on WebDirect, which ought to be really interesting because, <laughs> yeah, WebDirect is, uh, it's a client, but it's like a red-haired step client. It's not as good as Pro and Go is, just to, just the way it is. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Is, FMS, is starting point up on the website. I was told the version number will be version 20. We are going to the year marking it with the year. Claris will be doing this some point. So at some point, it's kind of convenient that the year is, ni is 19 or 20 right now, the year's 20. And Claris is on 19 going to 20. So they could say it's a version or whatever and it's an easy segue. For me, it's the current version is eight or zero eight and we're gonna jump to 20. Just because we want to put the year on there. That way our year of starting point matches the year of the version of FileMaker that it kind of goes with. I, I've got people who are going to whine that the new one doesn't work with 19. I can't help that, right? Um, Claire's has made it very clear that they expect uh, the consultants who are part of their official, you know, consultant program will support the shipping products and market or the supported products and market, which means they expect us to support 19 and 18 and 17 for a little while, right? And then that'll go away. Um, so anyway, yeah, so it's uh, the current one, it has some, it uses new features for the calendar that are 19 specific features. So you need to have 19 to use the new starting point. Um, so if you don't want to use the new starting, uh, new, new file maker, then you can't use the new free software. So nothing I can do about that. Uh, our goal is to make it better. And the only way to make it better is to use the newer features. So that does come up. And so uh, questions about this. So, you know, we're talking about the idea of the layouts. Um, the layout being here and the layout, this is a, obviously a Mac or Windows layout. This is a touch layout. Um, it can be used on the Mac or Windows just fine, but it's really designed to rotate all the way to a, a portrait uh, mode, right? Uh, as opposed to a landscape mode. And if I go to browse mode over here, see if it'll let me do that. Yeah, it did let me do that. So I come out over here. And so what happens is, is so we have this, we have a video course called user interface. User UI UX course, and really it's a Nick Hunter course. The parts in there where I'm talking are basically me reproducing what Nick had done. What I figured out is that enough people could understand Nick that it, his, his language, his accent is not sufficiently bad to cause problems. Um, initially, we thought that was more of an issue, so we ended up redoing the stuff that he did, and I would do it. But it's easier, cheaper, better just to have him deliver the content directly. But that course is part Nick, part myself. It's a UI user uh, experience, uh, user interface slash user experience, UX, UI. Those are two totally different things. Um, so if you go to the uh, video player here, uh, what will happen is you don't see it right now, but it will come up here as a current course. So it's one of our current courses. And then you can go through because what Nick is going to explain is how you build this stuff for the iPad versus the iPhone. With the iPhone, you basically build it as a one or two column uh, interface sideways, mostly a one column, like the interface. You now see that column right there? And then Nick has a two column, a second column here, um, which it's sliding, adjusting a little bit. But you could actually build a, uh, a one column interface for the iPhone, 
right? Um, once again, and uh, or you know maybe do two columns, or you know the whole idea is to make it take one column away. He we, he addresses that in that video, in that video course. So that is the UI UX course. Those of you who took delivery our training last year probably have that video player, the old one. Um, I just added the content in last night to our system, and then I will push it live later today. Um, so we have the calculations in here. We have location functions, which are GPS. On tap gesture, really great. So you have the ability to uh, track um, the taps, right? So let me see, next, uh, get sensor. Um, so we come back over here. Let me just go to the taps, right? So let me see, tap. So you can do, I should really tell you what this does. It's not, I have to work on this a little bit, but um, if I go to um, here, I'm going to, I'm just going to, well, what I want to do, I want to actually, um, let's see, can I go up and open a file? Yeah, launch center. Up here top left, I want to launch. I'm going to leave pro, uh, starting point running. I want to go back to resense at the bottom. I want to go to the training tool here. Log in, it's going to use my fingerprint to reauthenticate. And so I'm in here. I want to go to, cal uh, I'm trying to click it with a mouse. Let me not do that. I'm going to put it over here. And I'm going to say calculations, and then I'm going to say tap gesture. So it doesn't do all the taps, but it does a single tap, um, right? Uh, there was one tap. If I do two, okay, so tap count. Watch right here. So this is another one right here. It's pretty useful. So there is some gesture stuff in here. So I can do a single tap. I just did a single tap. Number of fingers, a single tap. What if I do two fingers? Can't see me up there, little bunny rabbits here. Hello. Two fingers, one tap, boom. There it is, two fingers, one tap, okay? Now, what if I do a one finger double tap? There's two taps, what if I do three? So what it does is that if you look this up, um, this, uh, oh, let me click on that, see if it'll bring that up. Is that, it's not a link, how come that's not a link? So what we do is we go to help and you can check that out. It'll give you some more information on it. It's limited in what it can do. So what we do is we say get, and I might fix this, trigger G, to say this should be trigger gesture tap. Here we go. So it'll tap, it traps. Here's what it traps. One, tap one, two, or three fingers, right? Double tap, one finger, tap with two fingers, right? So that's what it supports. This needs to be on that little layout over there. Um, so as you can't see this, there it is. So this is the um, information, right? So interesting. So this is, it doesn't do quadruple taps or 20 taps. If you tap 20 times back to back, uh, <laughs> yeah, 20 taps, it's not going to catch that. It just catches some of the basic stuff here. So scripting, we can go into scripting and look at scripting. I'm going to go ahead and zoom back out here. Close that, come back over here, come back over here to this tool here. Although I'm in the wrong one, I need to be on this one here. So these are all really the script steps that have some sort of behavioral differences in them. Um, I'm pretty sure most of these have not been updated or changed in any way. Um, there is the get the network type can be kind of handy for those of you who haven't seen this. You can look in here, you can see that. Uh, you can determine what kind of connection you have. So if you have like a really gnarly report, uh, and the person isn't on a is on a cellular connection. You might want to like uh, object to that. Um, I guess eventually cellular cellular is two G, three G, four G, or five G. I guess um, I don't have any five G stuff. Four G is pretty damn fast if you get it where you're not sharing it with a bunch of people. Um, pretty nice. I don't have too much of a problem with that. So if I run it right now for fun, we are on the Wi-Fi, which is what's happening right now. Um, I guess you could I guess you could plug a lightning connector to an ethernet connector and then plug in a wire, maybe. I don't know, I've not tried that with an iPad, at least not in recent memory. So uh, that your mileage may vary on that one. If I go back to scripting, we take a look at the scripting items here. Uh, iBeacon support, okay? Just just claw out your eyes and run screaming if someone says do iBeacon. Now, we are gonna add the near field uh, communication stuff. I think that's more reliable, but the iBeacon stuff, you've seen the, um, You've seen the, uh, there's a pretty funny video in that thing somewhere where we, uh, not so much in here, but um, 
you saw the me scanning the bunny, right? And so it's it's more like a when you're scanning, it's like the if, if those of you who remember the original um, uh, Cameron, I can remember they did the movie Aliens, right? And they're in the f uh, second movie, and it's like one of the best. It's like still kids watch it. It's still one of the best movies out there. It's not really horrifically out of date. And the aliens are coming closer, and you have the little scanners going doo doo. And the pitch keeps going higher as the aliens get closer. That's what I beacon is without the little alien part of it. Um, so it just sucks enough that um, <laughs> it's not. I mean, the whole idea is like Blade Runner, right? You like if you walk through the mall, right? All the advertisers and people to see it. Oh, they would say, "Oh, there's Richard Carlton. He likes Max. He likes helicopters. He likes you know rugged art doors kind of stuff." And rah, 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 rah. and so they start putting ads out for me because they know I like stuff. My wife likes certain stuff. I get Ken Tui out there. They'll probably start putting, "Hey, you want this hot air balloon?" And then, "Hey, your hot air balloon might catch on fire, so you want this parachute?" They'll start selling stuff to you because they know who you are because your watch probably has a UUID that talks to them and then they start getting this eye beacon stuff well it sucks so maybe they'll use near field communication that's the whole idea watch some of these like futuristic movies and as you walk through the store they figure out who you are so that whole idea about gdpr privacy and stuff doesn't exist in the future obviously for those of you in europe good luck with that um and they try to sell you whatever right um you know that maybe they find out that imog his car is broke down and they're going to sell him a new you know bmw whatever right um you know it's funny people see car commercials they're all over the place in the united states like constantly about get this car get this truck, get this truck. And, you, and you just learn to tune it out until the day that your car is like wreck wreck uh you know broke down and in pieces and you're thinking about it and suddenly you start paying attention to car commercials right so it's they instead of you tuning that out what if they could customize it that what's this stuff is about so value list a little differently in uh, go and pro right um, we also have the on-screen keyboards. I guess we should probably talk about that. It would be under probably input methods. Barcode scanning, signature capture. Listen, signature capture is really basic, right? Here it is. Welcome to signature capture, right? So you can do all sorts of stuff. New features, right? Overlay, you can try the overlay. So there's the overlay mode. You can do the full screen mode, which is the whole screen, which is great. And then this tool, awesome. This tool, we built this. I love this tool. Then you can do embedded. So embedded is where if your little container field is big enough, it will just do the signature in that container or in that spot. So here's embedded, so it's in that little spot. If you make it too small, it will default to overview or full screen or something. So it has to be a minimum size. Obviously, you want to test your application before you turn it loose. Uh, yeah, we're just going through basics of FileMaker Go, uh, Bunny. Uh, sorry about that. Um, we are just doing that. It's obviously very quiet. Not a lot of questions here. So um, that was the uh, input method there. Let me go back. Do we have the keyboard? Import from FileMaker. FileMaker Go with Siri. They have a new Siri shortcut, so we'll put that in here. Um, but listen, Siri screws up enough for me that it's frequently turned off. Um, because I like my daughter's name is Sarah. <laughs> Listen to this. Hey Sarah, you want to go get lunch? And that's Siri in there on my on my desk around the corner from my broadcast studio at my desk saying, "Hey, what do you want to do? Get for lunch?" She's still now talking. I can hear her in there. So um, the tech sucks on that end of it. I mean, sometimes it gets it right, but it's like. Eh. So printing, input method, miscellaneous issues, uh, scripting, usability. How about usability? Keyboard state, here we go. Doo, doo, doo. So we could uh, have a keyboard here. We could toggle the keyboard. Uh, keyboard is hidden, keyboard is enabled. I click on there. You can do custom keyboards too, which is really cool. Where is that at? Where is the custom keyboards? It should be in here. Tabs. Next, object keystroke. We worked at that. We looked at that. Looked at that. Previous. That's another. I got to verify that's still the case. The launch center has changed a little bit. Uh, value list. Text. Oh, text editing. And autocomplete font styles. Yeah, not all fonts and not all styles are supported. Um, well, not text editing. Digital media. This, is, of course, is all the container management. Um, Web viewers. Web viewers in Go are limited by uh, RAM memory and by processor horsepower. So you can do web viewer stuff in Pro that when you take it to Go, if you do too many of them, it'll explode. 
Like if I do, let me see here. Let me do the go. Okay, so it talks about there. I need to update this a little bit. What it'll do typically is it will uh, 404. Yeah, I got to fix this. Um, what it'll do is it will, if you're not actively using it, um, let me zoom in a little bit here. Okay, so the, oh, you can't see it. Let me move it. See the little icon right over here? See that? That is a web viewer that Go has determined that we probably don't want or we're not interacting with it. So it takes a screenshot of the web viewer <laughs> and it sticks it in there. So that's a screenshot of that web viewer at one point. If I click on it, it'll make it live. The little thing goes away. Now I'm actively doing stuff, right? Uh, so that's what. So this one now, the COVID one, that's the Apple website. That is a screenshot. So it will, in order to, because in the old days, you put a bunch of web viewers on here and eventually go really slow and crash. That's never a good answer. So they, Claris engineers, engineered it. So if you start to stress it and it's trying to keep up and it can't, it'll start doing screenshots. And the criteria for when it does screenshots and when it doesn't changes from release to release. It also changes, they do a check on the amount of RAM they have and the kind of uh, processor on here. Um, and it will adjust based upon that. So it does change. I would give you the exact numbers right now, but I have to talk to the engineer who worked on it. And uh, <laughs> I can't get in front of them right now because they, uh, they're just hard people to, uh, one of the one of Claris's strat strategies is to keep me separated from the uh, engineers, because then I would ask a question that I would give you information on. Uh, we cannot have that. So uh, welcome to the world that we live in. Uh, let's see, exporting snapshot links, um, tricks. Where's the stupid? It's not under keyboards. Keyboard touch state. You can do different kinds of keyboards. It's like pretty straightforward stuff. I wanted to show that to you. Uh, tab order interaction. When do you guys know where this is at? Uh, zooming, key, usability, calculations, not really there. I guess it could be under scripting, maybe. It'd be like, um, well, let's just do it on a, hmm. well, let me, um, let me close this. Well, let me go over here. I'm going to switch apps. So I'm in this app. I'm on this screen right here. Let me go into a phone number app. Ah, you see that? That's cool. That's what I'm talking about. So what you do is when you're in Pro, so say let's go back over to Pro. Go to Recents. Go to Starting Point. See if it'll open it up. And what happens is I'm not, these are not the same copies of Starting Point, but the, the, the settings are the same. If I manually, I go to Layout Mode, and I go to, I'm going to manually navigate to the Touch Layout Contact Data Entry Screen, and I click over on the field right here. Uh, I'm going to move myself out of the way. These are the options over on the right side that are specific to that field, right? So as you click, once again, there are settings over here, right? You've got the data setting. You've got this uh, appearance setting. You've got the style setting and the position setting. So you go over here to Data, and what you're going to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to make it like this and I'm going to zoom in so you can see this. And what you do is you got, if you, if, if big, a big, big, big if, you're in go, uh, go, it will give you the kind of keyboard. Keyboard, these different kinds of keyboards, right? They're all different little kinds of keyboards. So um, it says if, so it's not saying it's going to do this to us on Pro. If we go to go or somehow you're on Windows with a touch screen and it decides to trigger this, I'd have to see if that's doing that right now. But basically, um, I don't have a touch screen Windows computer right now. So you folks, could, one of you could let me know about that. But the idea is that it's going to pop that field and it's going to pop a phone compliant keyboard as opposed to like a data type keyboard or an ASCII keyboard or an email. This keyboard is designed for people putting in their email. So it has some shortcuts and the app or the at sign is really easy to get to. It makes some simple. Uh, simplifications it's kind of nice so that's an important thing to understand too so um, once again very cool stuff here um, but I definitely you know it's kind of a, a hodgepodge of things once again I'm gonna uh, come back over here uh, to I'm gonna go to my slack over here I'm gonna go to uh, the doc Claris has some documentation things you need to know about go uh, if you build once again you're gonna build it let me zoom out here you're gonna build this in pro and then you're going to take it to go and test. So you really want to be able to have it running on Pro and test in real time on an iPhone or iPad. 
Um, you can do that without server or cloud. If you need to test WebDirect, which is what we're going to start doing tomorrow, same kind of conversation, but we're playing with WebDirect on the browser, right? Um, and I'll see if I can get out the uh, the, the Chromebook too, because that's relevant in this conversation. Um, but the idea is that in that case, if you have WebDirect, that ha that WebDirect is is a client that's artificially generated by a web browser, and so it has to come from Ma FileMaker server, Mac or Windows, or I guess Linux, or it has to come from Cloud One or Cloud Two. Depends on which cloud you're using, but they both do it. So that's kind of tomorrow's conversation, very similar to this, but we're just taking our first steps and playing with this, understanding what we're getting into. Yesterday we covered the uh, privileges and security considerations. Um, I think it's easier to test and build with this because you can use the peer-to-peer -peer sharing. You can have FileMaker Pro and Mac or Windows talk to the iPad or whatever directly on your local area network. Um, but that's where you have to get into this FileMaker server minimum, and that's where the FileMaker developer description comes in. So this is the technical documentation. I'm going to go and post it again here for you, all three groups. And this is the uh, kind of FileMaker's write-up on the things you need to consider when you're building Go. Um, and it's, uh, I think a lot of it's kind of common sense, but you're going to probably build layouts that are specific to the iOS device, especially if it's a phone. I can see you kind of weaseling away, getting away with iPad and desktop or laptop uh, together on one layout. You could do that. But doing that with a phone is just going to make for a really ugly, because we built some le phone layouts in here. And this is, I haven't mentioned this to you, but this is something else that does happen quite a bit. So here's phone. You see how limited that is. That's just super limited. Here's what people say. They go, Richard, I think even John Pollard said to me this once, right? Hey, how come you don't have Go uh, iPhone layouts for all the layouts, right? And, and, and the reason is because I know better, right? Uh, also, because I'm the one pays for it, and it's free for everyone else. So because the guy writes a check does have some influence on what happens with it. But there's a reason for it. It's not just because I want to save money. It's because what happens is, is I get people in meetings, customers, Hey, Richard, we're going to do this with phones. Okay, great. What kind of phone? Doesn't matter. Could we do web direct on Android phones or go on iPhones? We're going to build it all on iPhones, and they start building it. And so what happens, they get out, uh, out on the town, and they're using their iPhone, and then, they, and then they're like, well, you know, I can't fit a lot of stuff on here, but I don't want the laptop. So then, then someone goes, well, dude, we should try an iPad. So then one of them tries an iPad. And then another one tries the iPad, and suddenly they're like, oh, we'll get an iPad mini or a 9-inch. There's three sizes of iPad. There's the mini, which is kind of a really big phone. There's also the 10-inch the or 9.5, 10-inch. And then there's like this 12.5 or 13-inch one. And what happens is they go from, we've got to have a phone. We need the money. We want this in there right now so everyone can have it in their pocket, too. It sucks. It's so limited that I will tell everyone just to get an iPad and put that in their bag. Um, and so as they interact with it and they have to suffer through an interface that small, listen, if you're 20 and you're doing Snapchat and watching videos and stuff, then the phone is fine. But in biz, the world of business, when you need more than first name, last name, and email address, which is what you have on the screen here, you want a bigger screen. I have almost 100% of the time have customers unwind what they say and they rewind back to saying, Oh, we just want the iPad. So that's why there's only a limited phone in here because I don't know how many people would actually use it. Most of them wouldn't because as soon as they have to write the check to pay for it, they're like, well, it will be more effective and efficient if we're out on the road using an iPad. Okay. So suddenly it's like all that work and all the money that went into this phone, whoosh, toss it. Right. So um, that's kind of the uh, conversation with that. I mean, you could be the person that has a business model that's so simple, like go to this location, take a picture of the building and upload it. That's really simple. But if you're doing any sort of CRM, selling anything, doing tech support, doing project management delivery, the phone is just going to piss you off. I think the iPad mini would be the smallest one you'd want to do. Uh, keep that in mind. So the iPad mini, I have one in there. It's about eh, it's about a third less than this. It's not too bad. Actually, I really like the size. It's really a cool size. That is almost a little unwieldy. I could almost, the iPad mini, I've used it, especially once again in an aircraft where space is at a premium. Um, you just can't put a lot on it, but if you have a fairly narrow set of things you're doing, then it's not too bad. Um, as it turns out, when I fly, I fly um, with the standard 10-inch iPad um, because the newer one's a little bit brighter, and when you're 
in a bright environment with lots of windows. You want a, uh, a device with as much brightness as it has. The newest iPads have a little bit higher brightness rating on the, uh, the flat panel. All the way up. Yeah, so Ken says, yeah, he ended up with special iPhone layouts because it doesn't fit on the iPad version. Yeah, exactly. So once again, this is different than this, which is different than uh, Pro. So that's the issue. So once again, you could end up having three sets of layouts. And people are like, oh, I don't want to pay for that. Well, then the lowest common denominator is that you're going to have this right here, and that's going to be your interface. There you go. That's awesome. So that's the problem with that. Um, we built a couple things, and in, in this is a starting point where you could see like the estimates and you could see the invoices, uh, but, but there, we, we don't let you drill into them. So you can see a summary. The idea is that you could look someone up, see a summary of their activity, but not really drill down to get out details because then that requires tons and tons and tons of work and man hours, right? So the idea was to kind of, if you're on the phone, you can kind of get a summary of how busy that person is if that makes sense so anyway uh bunny got home but yeah this is good kind of a good introduction it's a lot of little smattering of little items about building a go application we built the go application yesterday we got it running on both it's not that hard you just have to take it's really you take everything you know about pro and then you adjust certain elements of it the touch screen is one the screen size another um the the fundamental nature of it being wireless all the time not really anything else um, that's a good one. All right, everyone. I appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you. More importantly, great job up front protecting this quarterback to give you a chance. And that's all you can ask for. Oh. Trying to rally down 10. 9.25 to go here in the fourth. Short motion by Amendola from the left. Brady takes the shot. Goes down. Stands in. Throws it left for Amendola. Reaches up and snaps a high throw and lands inside the 10. Rolling to the 9. Ball slightly behind him. Again, he makes the grab.